for days, the wind has been in the south. It shook and played in the moors and went dandering up the sleeping grampians. But it brought more heat than cold, and all the parks were fair parched, sucked dry. The red clay soil of Kinradi gaping open for the rain that never seemed coming. Some said the north that had rain enough, with a D in spate, and bairns hooking stranded salmon down in the shallows. But that was up Aberdeen way, where I was born and lived for my first 16 years. We dwelled then on the croft of Cairn Dhu in Echt. My father was John Guthrie and my mother Jean. I was their only daughter and they called me Christine. Christine? Chris, are you in by? I'm in the kitchen, Mother. But says you're out now. Oh, do you never tire of all your schooling and reading, lass? No, I like it fine. And Father says if I stick in at my lessons, I might come out to be a teacher myself. I was very pleased when you were that bursary. You'd like to be a teacher, wouldn't you? I'd like it real well. Chris Quine, you spend our much time with your books when you could be out being happy. Your best days are now, Chris. When you're neither bairn nor woman, there's the countryside your own and you it's. But for all my reading and schooling, two Chris Guthrie's the word that fought for my heart and tormented me. You'd hate the land and the coarse speak of the folk one day, and the learning would be brave and fine. Then next day, you'd waken with peewits crying across the hills, deep and deep, crying in the heart of you, and the smell of the earth in your face. Almost you'd cry for that, the beauty of it, and the sweetness of the Scottish land and skies. And you wanted the Scots words to tell it to your heart. Then the moment passed, and you became the English Chris again. Back to the English words, so sharp and clean and true. For a while. For a while. Till they slid so smooth from your throat. You knew they could never say anything that was worth saying at all. He's got a fine club belly on him, eh, Walt? Aye, has that. Father rode him all the way from Aberdeen after he bought him. What's he called? Well, his name's Prince. But I'll not call him that. I'll call him Jehovah. <laughs> That's a grand name, Will. I, I heard the minister used it in church one Sunday. I've been saving it up ever since. Eh? Get over, Jehovah. <laughs> <laughs> what was that you said, Will? I asked you what you called the horse. Jehovah. Oh. <laughs> Mind my money. If I ever hear you again, take your maker's name in vain. If I ever hear you use that word again, I'll lip you. Now you mind that? I'll lip you like a lamb. So Will hated father. He was 16 years of age and near a man. But father could still make him cry like a bairn. The twins were born soon after. And mother had as awful a time as she'd always had. He'll know if they come in the evening. Say bad we twins. Aye, bad. Been bad before, but never this bad. Well, man, you wouldn't be told.
doctor stayed the whole night. My brothers, Dodd and Alec, shivered and cried in their room till father went up and scalped them right so. They had something to cry for then, but they didn't care. Then he came downstairs again, though he hadn't been in bed for 40 hours, and sat with his head in his hands. God forgive me the lust of the flesh, this miserable sinner. It's the bonny red hair ever that rouses me and tempts my soul to hell. Have you nothing better than to stand there like a gulk? I, I came down to see to the towels. Then see to them and set the table. The doctor will be wanting his breakfast. Lay it through in the parlor there. What'll I give him, Father? Boil him an egg. Move, damn you. It's near morning outside. my eyes up there for hearing mother. I had no sleep myself. None of us have. It's as though she was being torn and torn in the teeth of beasts and couldn't thrill it any longer. Aye. That was the first being born. The other's still to come. Twins. Oh, she shouldn't be having one bairn, much less twins. She's too old for that, and Guthrie kens it. Father? Aye, father. The old beast. But, well, What's father to do it? Don't you know? Well, what's a bull to do with a calf, you fool? Here's your doctor. Only she's feared. She was a damn sight more to fear when she's having a beard of her own. Pour out the water quick. Into the pile of the pair of you. So that was the coming of the twins at Cairn Do. There'd been barely room for us all before that time. But when Mother spoke of it, Father wouldn't listen. More room. What more room do we want than we have? Do you think we're gentry? We're not gentry. But we're not tinks either. Though you might think it the way we're all living on top of one another. There was barely enough room before the twins came, but now there's eight of us. Eight? You've little to complain of. My own mother had nine bairns all at home in a place not half this size, just a button bairn in Petaudry. We know how you lived in Petaudry. We managed fine. And we must do the same. Be thankful if you do as well. My father was just a ploughman, but he brought us out to be God-fearing and decent. Aye, we must be that. Aye, we must. And I'll tell you this. If just one of your bairns turns out half as good, your face need never redden with shame. You might have some thought for Chris and Will. The lass is near full-grown. She should have a room of her own. 
can do is not big enough for all of us. That's a fell good farm. You know, it took years of sweat and charming to get the hardness out of the land. Aye. And the hardness has gone elsewhere. Times I think you love that land better than any of us. Or your own soul, even. If there's to be no more rooms, there's to be no more bairns. There shouldn't have been anyway. Four of a family was fine, now there's six. Fine? We'll take what God in his mercy may send to us, woman. Now see you to that. I'm taking up the lease again. Well, well. What to buy down here, then? We are that. So content yourself. Move it. With a poor beast half feared to death. And no wonder. You come around that corner there, spitting and barking like a tank dog with distemper. Oh, boy. Oh, oh. I said you're causing an obstruction, my man. I am not your man, thank God. For if I was, I'd take a shovel and scrape the muck and paint off your face before giving it a damn good wash. Take a note of his nameplate, you hear? Take a note of his nameplate. Go on, my manny. Do as the dirt of the gentry tells you. It's Guthrie. John Guthrie. Mr. John Guthrie. You haven't heard the last of this, Mr. Guthrie. We're leaving, can do. Aye. He was in a fair rage when he was told they weren't renewing the lease. Yon woman was a friend of the landlord's, a cousin or something. <laughs> Still, it might teach Guthrie to keep a civil tongue in his head. He'll be a guy sore of having to leave. Yeah, maybe, but he's got no choice now. <coughs> Mother will be pleased, though. Where will we go? Blaweary, it's called. Blaweary? I think in Roddy down in the hall of the Mairns. What's the house like, John? Oh, it's a fine, brave house for a wee place. It has three stories and a good kitchen. And there's a fair stretch of garden down to the road. A garden? Aye, and there's beech trees growing in it. And the agent said the hedges in the summer grew as bonny wee honeysuckle as you ever saw. Sounds a right fine place. Aye. And if we're going to live in the smelly honeysuckle, we might farm the bit place with profit. It hasn't had a tenant for a year. And the parks will need a fair amount of work. Fifty-six acres of red clay. For buy some moor that runs up to a lock at the top. Can Raddy the Mairns? It's guy far away. Well, there's no place like Aberdeen. All folks are fine as them that bide by the dawn. But I think I'll like your Blaweary well enough. When do we move? January. And it's an old month to be moving. Wild weather it was that January. And the night on the slug road was smoring with sleet when they crossed over into the mountains. The cattle bunched them, tails to the wind, refusing the sting of the sleet. South across the uncouthy hills was a world cold, unchancy. Come and well! Keep the cattle moving! John! What was that? It better put up at Fort Lathen. Come to hell, you think I'm made a cellar? No, I don't. But if the carts get stuck again, we might all die of the night. This is the worst, Pat. Once we're over it, Kid Roddy's just ahead. Have you no sense, you blood? Keep them moving. So that was our coming to blow weary in Kid Roddy of the Merns. We slept late into the next morning, coming up cold and drizzly from the sea. All the darkness I heard that sea, a shoom shoom that moaned by the lonely cliffs. Not that John Guthrie listened to such sounds. Well, Chris, get up! How many times do you have to be shouted? There's work to be done and gear to be shifted. You should be sick with your shame at yourselves, lying there, stinking your beds with the day half gone. You two, set that fire before I warm your backside for you. Go on, hurry up!
Broke at a fair bad night for moving into Blaviri. They had that, gee. I've never seen the like. Eh. Uh, it hasn't been your old buyer much good, are you? God, uh, Mrs. Monroe, this is an awful buyer you have. It must leak like a civet times. It's good enough for the likes of us. Oh, aye, as you say. Oh, it's good enough for poor folks like us. And who's poor? Let me tell you this, Chase Strachan. We've never needed anybody to come to our help. Though we don't boast and blow about it all over the countryside, like some I could mention. Oh, I meant no offence, Mrs. Monroe. No offence of any kind. Your old place is nothing to blow about. Mm. Oh, no, no, I wouldn't say that. Peasy's Knock's a fine wee farm. Aye, ah, and your park's of a fine black loam, Che. Not red clay like the rest of Conradi sits on. Ah, it would be. But in a scanner, yeah, that you can as much as change your shirt without some old fashioned brute staring in it. <laughs> it doesn't bother me or Kirsty. No, it's the yeah. smell that bothers your wife. Oh, what's a bit of guff? If she'd come across some of the smells I did in South Africa, she'd never as much as notice them. Much less ran boring to the neighbours about them. Well, she won't have so far to run now that the new folk have moved yeah. into Blawiri. Have they? Aye, Guthrie. John Guthrie, I'm told. Some creature from up north. I live a hard time with Blawiri. It's coarse land, but it's kind of lonely up there in the brae. You have spoken to him? No yet, but uh, can't take it up to see if Mrs. Guthrie needed any help. Oh, likely they will. It's a true enough saying, out of the world and into Blawiri. <laughs> Who'd think a place could get into such a state in a 12 months with nobody living in it? It's right good of you to help, Mrs. Strachan. That's no more than neighbourly. And my name's Kirsty. She would have come with me, but he promised to stop by at Cuddiston to mend the roof of their buyer. Oh, he's a handy billy che if you want anything done. He'll never cough. Pick in a horse, kill a pig, all in a jiffy. You mentioned the Cuddiston. Is that the place down by the crossroads? Aye, the Monroe's farm. Same size as pieces now. But you wouldn't think it to hear Monroe talk. Can blow and bombast till he fair scunners you. It was little enough for easy. The place is needed been mucked for a harvest this spring. That may be accounts for Monroe's neck. His neck? Some folks say he can't get the mud washed out of it. Others say he's never tried. <laughs> You're not friends then? Oh, aye, friends enough. There's worse folk than Monroe. The chases them into the all in jail. <laughs> ah, but no harm to the pair of them. She's always ready to go out at any time of the night when some poor Billy comes trapping at her window. And why is that? Oh, she's the best midwife for miles around. It's fine to have one hand. Oh, why? She's out before you can whistle and snap in her order round the kitchen and tell the poor soul in child bed she might easily be worse. Druids work, they say. That's what they say. They were set up by the druids. He'll be the new tenant at Blawiri. Aye. Guthrie. John Guthrie. Yourself? Rob Duncan. Long Rob, they call me. I work the mill. So likely we'll be seeing each other. Likely. It's rough, coarse ground about here. Oh, it's that. I'm a bit like it myself. And I've been sweating and shoving away for three years to turn it into a park. But, oh, it's no half done yet. Oh, trade must be slack at the mill if you have time to waste on it. Oh, make time, man. I'm working when the rest of Conradi's away to bed. And I'm out again at the kick a day before the half of them's up. Uh, keeps me at it from Monday to Sunday. That's away some dark splatter of water. They say there's no bottom to it. Like the depth of a parson's depravity. Now, that's an ill thing to say about any minister. It's an ill thing to say about any loch. You get hard on the kirk, Mr. Duncan. Well, I have as much time for it as it has for me. And that's no much. I'm an atheist. Though, if Christ came down to Kinradi, he'd be welcome enough to a bit meal or milk at the mill. But dump the thing he'd get at the manse. These were the first of the Kinradi folk we met. But as that winter wore on and spring came in, we soon got to know the others right well, as well as they knew one another. Oh, why, Alec much is a grand worker. And Bridge End's no the worst farm in Kinradi. But as well, Ken, he's up to his great big muckle years in debt. No wonder well he's a slum a car for a wife. Cigarettes never out of her mouth. She's a speak half the men's we are smoking. There's never a mortal thing worries her. She aye just lights up a cigarette like a tink and says, Ah, well, it'll make no difference a hundred years after I'm dead. 
I pay no attention to what they say, though some of them have fine notions of themselves. Like God of Upper Hill. <laughs> you steer with Alec, that's my husband, says about him. <laughs> he struts about with his stick as proud as a cock in a midden. Oh, Gordon Fair fancies himself with his big farm and his leggings and his breeches. Mrs. Gordon's the same. Her father was some bit post office creature up in Stonehaven. Oh, God, to hear her talk, you would think he'd invented the post office and taken out a patent for it. Uh, and she's a fierce scudder when she starts talking about her two lassies. Of course, Nellie and Maggie Jean go to Stonehaven Academy. <laughs> I'm very anxious to learn not to speak coarse. Oh, they're so intelligent, I'm sure they'll be a great credit to me. Mind you, Maggie Jean's off a delicate. Yes, I had to take her to a specialist in Aberdeen just recently. Now, when I took my pig to see the specialist in Edinburgh, he up and said, Mr. Rob, this is a most unusual pig, but so intelligent. And you should send him to the academy, and someday he'll be a real credit to you. Oh, you know, there's no secrets in Kenradi, Chris. What did Mrs. Gordon say? Well, she turned as red as fire, and she forgot her English, and she cried out, Rob Duncan's a Nora Tink Brute. Oh. <laughs> Chris, get on with your studies. You've no time for daffin', and you will. Leave her alone. Oh, I think the lassie does too much studying as it is. I never see you out with your friends, Chris. The only quines of my own age are the servants up at the mains. You'll stay away from them, do you hear? They're nothing but gugs and gomerals screeching around the barn at night with the ploughman snickering after them. The lassie needs friends. Friends. Stick to your lessons and make a name for yourself. You've no time for friends. Take care her head doesn't soften with lessons. Books and learning can send for clean skite. Would you rather see her skite with learning or skite with... With what, John? With the sort of things that can happen in a godless parish like this. Kinradi may or may not have lacked a god, but it certainly lacked a minister. And three of them came down to try for its empty pulpit. What's today's candidate like? Cahoon's his name. He's an old but man for Banff. Well, he might be best. He'll quieten down at his age. No I be on the lookout for a bigger curtain, a bigger stipend. Aye, ah, you're right there, Alec. For if there's a body on earth that can skin a tink for his skin or preach a sermon in purgatory, it's an old cat, Minister. I'm told he spent years writing books and things. And unlikely all his spunks trickled out of his pen. No, no, there's no harm in books. Maybe no, but I hope he doesn't read his sermon. The Raddy's no liking for a minister that reads his sermon. But he did read his sermon. And that fair settled his hash to begin with. So hardly a soul paid heed to his reading, except myself and John Guthrie. But I thought it fine. He told of the long dead beasts of the Scottish land, in the times when jungle flowered its forests across the how, and a red sun rose on the steaming earth that the feet of man had still to tread. And he pictured the dark, slow tribes that came drifting across the lowlands of the northern seas. The great bear watched them come, and they hunted and fished and loved and died. God's children in the morn of time. And he brought the first voyages sailing the sounding coasts, and they built the heathen idols of the great stone rings. The golden age was over and past, and lust and cruelty trod the world. But this too passed, and Christ was arisen. A pinpoint of cosmic light far off in Palestine. The light that crept and wavered and did not die. The light that will yet shine as the sun on all the world, not least on the dark hows and hills of Scotland. Let us pray. He seems to think and that is the right course place since all the jungles dried up. Aye, and his prayers were gay short. Have you a word to say for the king of royal family at all? Odds will Ken, you're a great king's man, Alec. Ready to die for him every day of the week and twice on Sundays. 
Still, I didn't think much of the Reverend Cahoon myself. Because he didn't praise up your socialism, eh? That's what sermons should be about, how the rich and poor should be equal. What are you, Sibyl Weary? I liked him fine. He'll get my vote. He'll get faint few others. doesn't like anybody touching his shotgun. Nobody must handle it but himself. You've heard him say it. Ah, it's only an old muzzle loader. Please, Will, he'll be fell angry if he finds out. Well, he'll not find out. Hey, did you hear what Rob Duncan said about this? Will, please. He cried out, Hi, man, I didn't know you were a veteran of the 45. And Guthrie comes back with, Losh, Rob, were you cheating for get your mill even then? Oh, my father can take a bit of joke now and then. From everyone except his family. Touching my shot bag. And why would I want to do that? Well, some of you know this. There's barely enough here for one charge. So where are they? Hold your wish, John, you and your gun. Now, Gina, I'm asking you a question. What harm was in Will that he used it? You were using the gun, eh? Hi. Come out to the barn with me, Will. Father, you can't. Quiet, Chris. <gasps> Will's near 17. He's over all to be. Quiet, there. quiet, else I'll take you as well. Your father's roused, lass. You might as well cry to the tides at Kenef to keep away from the land. So, didn't he? Oh, oh, I can hardly, hardly sleep for the pain it Chris. Oh, I hate him, Chris. I hate him. <laughs> After a while, he stopped crying and fell asleep. And strange it seemed to me then, for I knew him bigger and older than I was, and somehow skin and hair and body stranger than once they had been, as though we were no longer children. Let us pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed... The Reverend thy... Stuart Gibbon was the third minister to make a try for the Kinradi Mans. And as I looked up at him, I knew well he'd please the Kinradi folk. His sermon, it was out of the Song of Solomon, and well and rare he preached it. How beautiful are thy feet with shoes, O prince's daughter! The joints of thy thighs are like jewels, the work of the hands, of cunning craftsmen. Thy navel is like an round goblet which wanteth not liquor. Thy belly is like an heap of wheat set about with lilies. Thy two breasts are like two young rows that are twins. The Song of Solomon has more meaning than one. 
It is Christ's description of the beauty and fine comeliness of the Kirk. And it is also a picture of womanly beauty, which moulds itself in the life and grace of that Kirk. As such, it is a perpetual manual for the women of Scotland, so that they may attain straight and fine lives in this world, and salvation in the next. I'm not saying but what he said the prayer right well. Aye, and there was one or two of them joined in right near the end, and that's guy seldom done in the Al Kirk. Mind you, he begged to be forgiven for his sins and not his trespasses. And what's the difference? Well, trespasses, some virgin teal. Oh, he's a pretty man and no mistake. Right, Carly Bull. Yeah, they were fair tickled to hear things like that read from the pulpit about a woman's breasts and thighs. Gee. And to know it was decent scripture with a higher meaning as well. Oh, I heard about him, the Reverend Gibbon. <laughs> well, preaching like that's a fine way of having your bit pleasure by proxy right in the front stalls of the kirk. I prefer to take mine more private like. Well, there's few that would put off tramping in to vote for him. No doubt. I heard they all sat there listening to him as though he was promising to pay their taxes at Martimus. Likely he'll be seeing him soon. Oh, you think so? Since the beginning of time in Kinradi, every minister has made a round of the parish when he was inducted. Some of them did it quick, and some did it slow. I think the Reverend Gibbon's one of the quick. Oh, it's coarse land hereabouts, Mr. Gibbon. Wet and raw most of the time. Parched and sucked dry, like now, when there's a drought. Ah, as you say, as you say. It's only a man who, from the north who could handle it so well. A man like yourself, Mr. Gibbon. Aye. Come here, Quinn, and meet Mr. Gibbon. This is my daughter, Chris. Mm-hmm. Well, girl, have you lost your tongue? How do you do, sir? Yeah, fine-looking lass, Mr. Guthrie. I hear you're right clever, Chrissy. She does well enough. She's at the college. And how do you like it, eh? Fine, sir. Ah, good, good. It takes education to smooth the path through life, as I'm sure your father's told you. Aye, sir. Uh-huh. And what is it you want to be? Like fine to be a teacher. Ah, you couldn't have a better ambition. There's no profession more honorable. I'm sorry I had to dash away, Mr. Gibbon, but if I don't put the twins to bed when they oh, want to Oh, don't apologize, Mrs. Guthrie. I've been quite content sitting here listening to your husband's conversation and enjoying your excellent tea. Let mm. me get you another cup. Ah, uh, thank you. No, I must be dandering along now. Well, it's been a pleasure meeting you, Mr. Guthrie. And Mrs. Guthrie. I'll uh -huh. just see you down the road, Mr. Uh, Gibbon. thank you. Thank you. Come over and see you some evening, Chrissy. Maybe the wife and I will be able to lend you some books to help in your studies, eh? Hmm? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I thought since I was passing, I'd just stop by and see how you were, Jean. Oh, come fine, Kirsty. To be a while yet. Oh, hi, Chris. Hello, Mrs. Draft. What are you doing in, in a day like this? Please, there hasn't been a drunk like this since 83. As a long Rob says, you can't blame this one in Gladstone. <laughs> Religio Medici. That's a queer like name for a book. I got a loan of it from the minister. Oh, you've been up at the manse then, have you? Did you meet Mr. Skippin? No, she was busy with her spring cleaning or something. Mm -hmm. I hear she's a bonny enough young thing in a thin gun away. I'm told she's some English creature he married in Edinburgh. You can tell they're right fond of each other. Oh, aye, I hear they kiss every time he goes out for a bit of a walk. You can hear a lot of things about other folk in Kinradi. Oh, but it's true, though. Once he came back from a bit of a jaunt and found her waiting for him, so he picked her up in his arms and ran upstairs, the both of them cuddling one another. Chris, away up and strip the beds, your own and Will's. You can give me a hand to wash the blankets. Aye, Mother. It's true, though. I heard it from the servant quine heard that comes from Gordon. Heard what? Ah, but the minister and his wife into their bedroom they went and closed the door. And they didn't come down for hours. They're just bare in the middle of the afternoon. It 
comes to the same thing at any time. Lad, Chris Quain. <laughs> Aye, John. Have you ever seen a drought the likes of this before? You shameless slimmer. Get your clothes on. What would folks say of the coin if they saw her there, near naked? Would be the speaking laughing stock of the place. Well, it wouldn't be the first time you've seen her naked last yourself. And if your neighbours haven't, they must have fathered their own bairns with their bricks on. It had been as though I saw a caged beast peep from his eyes. Like a fire that burned across the close. It went on and on as though I still stood there and he glowered at me. I hid my face below the blankets, but I couldn't forget. Next morning, when I was able to bear thinking of it no longer, I went to Mother and asked her straight. I'd never asked her anything of the kind before. Oh, Chris, don't ask me. Men? Men and bairns, I, I can't tell you a thing or advise you a thing. Mother, what's wrong? Is it... I heard you talking to Kirsty Strachan. Oh, Mother, I didn't mean to vex. It's not you, Chris Quayne. It's just life. <laughs> You'll have to face men for yourself when the time comes. There's none can stand and help you. Chris? Mind that for me sometime. If I can't thaw it any longer. Thaw what, Mother? What's the matter? Oh, we're daft, a pair of us. Away and fetch me a pail of water. I went out into the red hot weather. And then something came on me. I crept back, soft footed. And there Mother stood as I'd left her. White, lonely and sad. I didn't dare go into her. I just stood and looked. Something was happening to Mother. Things were happening to all of us. Nothing stayed the same, except maybe this weather. And if it went on much longer, the old minister's jungles would soon be sprouting back across the parks of the Howe. 
somebody was crying on me. Mind that for me sometime, if I can't thole it any longer. Poor Jean. It all came out at the inquiry. She poisoned herself. Herself and the twins. So I heard. Well, of an unsound mind, they said. Imagine that. An unsound mind. Oh, uh, maybe so. She was pregnant again, you see, and near daft with a fear of it. You tell me the lassie Chris never cried for days, but once she started, they couldn't get her stopped. Poor Jean. Hi. <laughs> an unsound mind. You knew you'd never be the same again. But the world went on, and you went with it. It was not only Mother and the twins that had died. The child in your heart had died too. The bairn that believed the hills were made for its play. Every road set fair with its warning posts and hands ready to snatch you back from the brink of danger. That died. And the Chris of the books and dreams died with it. Well, you believe in college now, I'll warrant. Education's debt, and you'd better clear of it. 
You'll find little time for dreaming when you're keeping house at Blawiri. You thought of the hours and days as a dark, cold pit you'd never escape. But you'd escaped. The black damp went out of the sunshine. And the world went on. The white faces and whispering ceased from the pit. You'd never be the same again. But the world went on and you went with it. So you folded up your dreams and laid them away by the dark, quiet corpse that was your childhood. You get back to school if I say so. And if I have any more of your lip, I'll let your backside until the skin turns blue. The boys have enough to put up with. They're afraid to go back to school. I'm afraid and ashamed. Nobody in my house has anything to feel ashamed for. Oh, is that a fact? Not even hearing a mother called a dafty. Now you watch your tongue. Well, that's what folk are saying, isn't it? Why should Alec and Dodd go back to school? I wouldn't. Now I'm warning you one more word. Ah, oh, you needn't glower at me. You take damn good care you never go near a mart or a market yourself nowadays. I have to do all your dirty work for you. By God, I'll smash your face in. Take care, Guthrie. Take care. Well, I need this table for baking. And the thing I've been meaning to ask you, where do you wander to at night, like a tank? to be done, then? About Dodd and Alec. I was wondering if Uncle Tom and Auntie Janet would take them. <laughs> Those two. Uncle Tom and his wee tin medals. Whatever you think, Will, they're kind enough folk and the boys would get their schooling in Aberdeen. Do you think he'll ask them? <sighs> well, if he does, he'll be too proud to tell us. So you're taking them, then? Aye, aye, no doubt about it, aye. <clears throat> Dodd and Alec will be fair pleased at the thought of coming to stay with you. Aye, aye, we'll get on fine. Uh, I'll teach the boys to play kites, aye. That's a grand game. Yeah, I won these for playing kites. Aye, well, that's it settled then. And that just settled, Joan. If we take the boys, we want to keep them. Yeah, what's that? Uh, Janet means that we would like to adopt them. So you'd steal the flesh of my body from me? Aye, Joan, just that. We've never a wane of our own. Though God knows it's no for the one to try, no? Mm. Hell blood breeds hell. Ah, Aye, what? it'll be a long time before I have to kill myself, because my man beds me like a breeding sow. You dirty bitch! I know, careful, Guthrie. She might be your sister, but she's my wife. Ah, and you're well matched the pair of you. At least he didn't saddle me with a kist full of bairns. No, he was never man enough. Ah, ah no, Guthrie, and you were man enough to see your wife in the kirkyard before her time. You hear what she's saying to me? Ah, you I should have... be left for what you've done. Ah. <laughs> any longer. Ah, oh, never heed the dirty old devils. <laughs> One's as bad as the other. Father, auntie, well, that midden that's covered with its wee tin medals. Come away to the park with me and we'll bring home the kai. Don't let father make a damn slave of you, Chris, as he'd like to do. That's easy enough said, Will. Uh, you were meant for better things than the weary plighter of the land and its life. She's sit and wait for the rain and the thaw. <sighs> Aye. Can't be that often enough. Though father wouldn't agree. You know what he always says. The salt of the earth are the folks that drive a straight drill and never look back. Ah, to hell with what Guthrie says. You do what you want. <laughs> I might. If I knew what it was. I'm like a ploughed field, Will. With all the furrows going crisscross. What else can I do but bide at home now? I don't know. But I'll be libbed, polaxed and gutted if I stay here. We've our own lives to lead. Where'll you go? Canada, maybe. Man can soon be his own master there. Canada? Oh, Will. And you could send for me as your housekeeper. Aye, uh, well, maybe. It, but maybe it would hardly suit you. 
that the only reason, huh? Or is there some other lass you'd sooner take? There's a lass in Drumlithy. Molly Douglas, she's called. And she's the one you go to see every night. I wondered what father meant. Come on. We'd best get the Kai home. With Alec and Dodd gone, there were only three of us sitting to meet at the kitchen table. I listened for days, for voices of folks that were dead or gone. But even that lost its strangeness in time. The harvest drew on. Lush and heavy enough, it had sprung and yellowed with the suns and rains of the last two months. Look at it. We should have left that old thing at Echt. Wished Wally might hear you. No, I don't care if he does. But he wants to get us a binder. Save our backs. Have you nothing to do, the pair of you? There's a harvest to be gathered in. You'd gather it a sight quicker if you bought a binder. I'll no hear other things. The old reaper's fine enough for them that's willing to work. Not that there's many about. But when folk breed, they all breed again. The scythe will come back into its own. Aye, and your reapers and binders will rot and rust. Ah, well, this one has, for hour long. I'm damned if I'll be seen driving the thing. I'll be the fool of Kinradi. If Kinradi's laughing can make a bigger fool of you than nature did, it'll be a miracle. Don't fret your doubt, my manny. I'll do the driving. Chris, you follow down at the tail and gather the shaves in. Come on, then, boy. Here. Every year at harvest time, there came something terrible and queer on Father. He couldn't handle a thing with a name. It was as if he grew stronger and crueler then. Bright and strong to the strength of the corn. Be the best weather for the harvest, but it's all to cut in a swither of heat, eh? It won't last well. The rain's due. <laughs> God help the crops that wait cutting then. <sighs> There's a mystery about. What is it? I'm looking for work, if you've got any. Maybe, maybe. Let's see the work you've done you first. Aye, find that. Aye, 
can sleep in here. There's a bed made up. Aye. Oh, and the water? Uh, well, I'll maybe take you on for a day or so if the weather holds. I'll be real content with that. Mm -hmm. I'll send my daughter out for some supper for you. See, the tinker's not eating with us, then. No, I wouldn't have him in the house. The creature might be rotten with lice. There's no good doing kindness to tanks. I'm sorry you have to take your supper out here. I'd have had you eat in the house if it wasn't for father. You better fash yourself about that, lass. I'm as little anxious for his company as he is for mine. For by, he's just a canradi clown. I've no laying my man yet, lass. I can see. Oh, that's a sore waste of hot blood like yours. So mind, if you want me, I'll be here. Mind not. I'll be here if you want me. with a stooking, and the weather might break. All right, mate. Uh, we'll be working night soon. Uh, not me. I'm having nothing to do with night working. Good night, Chris. Chris, get to your bed when you finish the milking. Aye, Father. So that was the harvest madness that came upon us. It said father singing hymns in the fields with a queer, keen shrillness that brought the sweat to the palms of your hands. That sent Will off to his lass in Drumlithy, evening upon evening. That caused, without beginning or reason, a strange ache to come in me. In my breasts, in my throat, and below my heart. And I thought of the tink lying there, and how easy it would be to steal down the stairs, across the close, dense black in the shadows, to the barn. <laughs> but then I would laugh at the daft thoughts and look at myself in the glass. I was growing up. Not bonny, perhaps, but limber and sweet. And so I saw myself with that grave brown face John Guthrie's blood had bequeathed me. So strange it felt with the beams of moonlight running across me. And I thought myself sweet and cool and fit for that lover who would someday come and hold me. So. Aye, the harvest madness was out in Kinradi, and if I was quick to master mine, others were not so fleet. Avondale. That's my name. You and Tavendale. Oh, I can who you are. You ken who I am, so you'll ken what I'm here about. <laughs> You're Shea Strachan from Peasy's Nap. Sarah Sinclair's brother-in-law. Just that. Alec much says he saw you and Sarah coming out of the large wood up by. Does he know? Don't deny it. He near jumped out of your skins, the pair of when he cried goodnight. The story will all over Conradi by now. Aye, likely it would be. You might try and hide with your lass at the top of Ben Nevis. Ten to one when you got there, you'd find some old Kinradi Creek sniggering themselves daft at your shame. Well, what do you intend to do about it, eh? Have you a mind to marry her, then? Uh, I think uh, she's a bit old for me. <laughs> what the hell are you laughing at? 
Little. Damn little. Myself, I feel like weeping at the sight of it. Oh, my she was more than a match for young Tavendale. Coarse, dour, highland brute. But then the rest of the bothy lads up and went for him. I heard the cheek at home to pieces his nap with hardly a stitch in his back. Aye, maybe so. But he left young Tavendale with a black eye big enough to sole your husband's boots. Oh, it's fair terrible what goes on in Kinradi. Monroe went up to see the minister at the manse the other day. He wanted giving signature in some lawyer's paper. But the minister wasn't at home. At least that's what he was told. But as he was coming home through the man's garden, he heard some rustling and squealing in the grass. So, Monroe picked up some gravel and threw it. And you'll never guess what. What? Up out of the grass rises the maid from the manse, oh. and she goes trailing past Monroe with a glazed look in her face. Wanton <laughs> bitch. <laughs> but there's more. Next thing, Monroe finds the Reverend Gibbon at his elbow, breathing great deep bass, and Monroe says, Well, well, Mr. Gibbon, you've surely been running a race. And straight into the manse he goes without a word, just slamming the door with a bang at mid he's still up in his boots. <laughs> well, that should about do it, I think. I thought you never spread scandal about folk, Rob. I don't. Only about horses. It may be a class minister's lower than them. Oh, well, likely the story's true enough. That can be imagination. Monroe never had any. Aye. First you and Tavendale and then the minister. <laughs> Must be the time of the year. How was your harvest at Blue Erie? Oh, the crops have fared none too badly this once. But you can see in a normal year, the corn will hardly come at all. Ah, it's fell coarse land you've got in these long stiff slopes. Ah, I've been staggered by the doorness of it. You know, it's coming plain to me, Rob, that the day of the crofter is finished. The day of the folk like ourselves. The last of the farming folk that wring their living from the land with their own bare hands. Ah, it's a sign of the times, Rob. Aye, a sign of the times when ministers go out and whore with the rest. A sign of the times when women take their own lives or flaunt their harlotries as they please. A sign of the times he saw in mother's killing of herself to shame him. For bitterness had grown and eaten away into the heart of him in his year at Blueiri. And he saw a darkness down on the land he loved better than his soul or God. Aye, laugh, you mucker. Then one night, I heard him get out of bed and go slow padding about like a great cat. A beast that sniffed and planned and smelled at the night. And he came soft along the cowering creek of the landing to stop by my door. I held my breath. You're sick with fright. Though what was there to be feared of? I heard his breath come quick and gasping, and the scuffle of his hand on the snake at the door. Then that stopped, and the house was quiet. But I didn't dare sleep again till Will came cluttering home in the still small hours. On my way up to the hell with a gun, Chris. Go see to the cattle before you go to bed. I'll see to them, Father. See the burning winds up from Tochty Way, Chris. Come away up the hill and have a try it ours. The damn sore and need it. I've got my jelly to make you go. Ah, to hell with your jelly. We'll all soon be jelly and bones in our grave ourselves. Come on. 
best leave it till Father's there. Ah, uh, maybe you're right. So far I'd caught the fence, old Guthrie would be casting me out to Blawiri for bringing his grey hairs in sorrow to the grave. What would you do if he did put you out? I would go. Would you get a fee? Oh, aye, damn the fears of that. With the harvest nearly over, you don't look all that sure to me. <laughs> well. All right. I met Douglas in Drumlithy yesterday. She asked me to ask you to go and see her. Well. Oh, I heard you. What's the good? I can't have a coin like other folk. I haven't even got a fee, as you said. Maybe she doesn't want your fee. Just you. Please, Chris. Tell Walt to ride over and see me again. Tell him to come tonight. I just can't bear it without him any longer. I don't care if that sounds shameless. Chris, I can see what you're thinking. You think that then like all the rest of them, but it isn't true. I just love him so sore. I can't live if I don't see Will. They're saying things about her and you and Drumlithy. Who are saying things? Galt, another course stinks like that. Galt, the gardener, yon big creche. Aye. I was in getting the blackberries for the jam the other day, and he looked at me in a queer kind of way. Then he started joking and hinting and saying things. What things? Oh, aye. We haven't seen much of wool here of late. Faith and the roses are fair fading from Molly Douglas's cheeks. What the eye say? That Molly's with a bairn to you, and that you're biding away from her now. God said that. He hinted at it. But he'll do more than hint when he's not speaking to a sister of yours. He said that about Molly. The aura swine. God, I'll mash that bloody Galt's head in so his own mother won't know well, it. Well, I know how you feel. I could have clouted him myself. But that would only stir up worse scandal. Folk would just snigger and say there was something sure in the story of Molly's condition. Oh, what am I to do, Chris? Do you... Do you love her, Will? Uh, ach, I'm away to drum with you. Very <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a fine night. Don't take a rip tonight, Will. The grasses are wet for lion horn. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking to me. Who else? Uh, young Guff, you fear gone daft. The man's old enough to be a father. Sure. If I had a father like that, I'd kill him, then go drown myself. Your father's in the kitchen, is he? Aye, sir. Aye. Right. Good evening, Mr. Guthrie. Can I have a word with Will? Well, father wants you. He's got the minister with him. What does he want? You can find. He'll have heard about that tushy you had with Galt last night. Do you think so? Oh, Will, everybody's heard of it. You're the laughing stock of Kinradi. Oh, but Chris. When I went to Drumlith, he had no intention of doing anything but seeing Molly. Oh, I believe you. Well, if he wants to talk to you about, well, anything aye, else... Aye, aye, I'll keep my temper. <laughs> Molly made me swear not to fly into a rage if they started their course hinting at her. What's this I hear about you and some other tink bitch in Drumlithy? What the devil are you talking about? Answer my question, Will. Well, put a question with some sense in it, then. Show some respect for your father, Will. Oh, I'm not a mind reader. Damn to hell, you cross brute. I might have put up with your lip as well as your whoring every night. Mr. Guthrie, Is it true there's a tink called Molly Douglas that's with Bairn by you? If you call Molly Douglas a tink again, I'll knock your damn teeth down your throat. Oh, well. Ah, even if you are my father. <laughs> oh, mind. Chris. Get to your bed. Ah, oh, don't bother, Chris. Uh, just a moment, Will. 
Where are you going? No, I can all say Keena should lie with my lass and get her with Ben. I'm off to try and oblige you. for a bit. Will, I heard what you said when you went away. But you didn't do it. Wouldn't be for one to have been pushed into it by half the holy muckers in Kinradi if I had. I bet you need to have no fears on that. I'd as soon cut my own throat as too hurt to Molly. So the minister's interfering brought no harm. And Faith, he'd more need to scrub out his own bit buyer. If the story of the servant quine was true. And soon after that, a worse scandal went on the rounds about him. And the way of it was that a bit daughter was born to the manse. And, proud as punch, he preached a grand sermon that Sunday. For unto us, a child is born. Celebrating in Aberdeen. I fell asleep on the train and went past Kinradi. <laughs> Kinradi. Oh, what a bloody place Kinradi is. <laughs> How would you like to live between a briar bush? And a rotten kale yard in the lee of a house with green shutters, eh? Bloody green shutters. Bloody Kinradi. Can you lie down with a quine for a minute with some half witted clod hopping crofter? He can stay throw stones at you. He threw a bloody stone at me. Aye. With little respect for God, a Kirker minister down in Kinradi. Man, it's awful the way the world's going. You can. I thought of resigning from the railway myself and taking to preaching. But after what you told me, I won't. So the winter came on and brought the first threshing of the season down in Kinradi. Father and Will were off to Peasy's nap at the heat of dawn. And an hour later, I followed to help Kirsty with the dinner and things. Looks as if I'll need some more broth, Chris. My will be in a minute, and he eats as if he hasn't seen food for a fortnight. <laughs> I took a look through there, and there's broth and chicken and beef and oat cakes and... Loaves and jelly and dumplings. So if anybody's guts enough to want more, he can away down to the turnip field and help himself. <laughs> <laughs> Man, goodness, and you're eating like a collie dog just let off its chain. Oh, you can fair build up an appetite at the threshing. Aye, ah, it is some folk helping a neighbour with the threshing's just a friendly act. The others, it's no more than a spree. <laughs> ah, Chris, maybe just another one eight or two, Chris. <laughs> Man, Blobier, she's fair expert getting your daughter. Aye, ah, the kitchen's more her style than college. Oh, you're right there. Ah, yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't you say that, good Easton. Oh, it's true enough. Education does more harm than good. No, 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 that's not exactly what I oh, say. But, but it's a fact. It's a coarse thing, learning. A coarse thing. Teaches your children a lot of damned nonsense that puts them above themselves. <laughs> I, some of them would turn round and give you a lip as quick as look. Oh, well, I suppose. For a moment, 
I saw the ill nature grin from the faces of them. And suddenly, I hated the lot. The other Chris of the books came back into my skin. And I saw them. The yokels and clowns everlasting. Dull-brained and crude. Then I was shamed, as I thought. Che and Long Rob they were, my clowns and yokels. The poorest folk in Kinradi. That many a clean wrong to that for education. Education's the thing the working man needs to bring him up level with the rest. I would have thought of his balance in the bank would do that. Hey, <laughs> now look here, for damn saying I it. can what you're saying. I agree with you. Ah, right. The more education, the more sense, and the less a cacks in minister. Ah, oh, no, no, we'll have no curse words about religion here. <laughs> aye, aye, Christy. Aye, aye well, oh, there's plenty of room over there. Aye, Chris, get a chair for you. Why don't you do that there? Look well. Aye. 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 Aye
No, it's a horse. Oh, God, that's all clighty. that if you and John Guthrie hadn't gone in for them? Ah, I was glad when the roof fell in and killed the other beasts. Aye. The God man, I never went to smell roasting beef again. Jay? Aye, Chris? You seen my father or Will anywhere? Likely they'll have gone home, lass. But little to do here now but glower at the fire and its mischief. Aye. Well, I'll await my bed then. Good night, Jay. Good night, Kirsty. Bye. Good night. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> you bitch. It was the first time a man had ever kissed me like that. Dark and frightening and terrible on the winter road. And that night, it was in my memory. Like being chased and bitten by a beast. But worse. And with something else in it. As though half I'd liked the beast and the biting. And that soft, unshaven cheek against my own. And then I fell asleep and dreamed of him. An awful dream that made me blush even while I knew I was dreaming.
Chateau Monet in 1912, we read up the beasts early in the evening. And then, after supper, sat close round the fire. Good, I wonder why Jean left us. And so we sat, thinking of her that was by us so kind and friendly and quick that last new year. So cold and quiet and forgotten now, with the little dead twins in the kirkyard of Kinradi. What a night it is. Oh, I'm not nice. Oh, dear. Happy New Year, Rob. Happy New Year, Steve. You'll take a dram, Rob. Oh, will that? The Mauser's near frozen with that walk up the hill. A little thought of. More company, John. It sounds like it. Good New Year to your health. Happy New Year. I'm not a foot in my nut. Oh, rest. Oh, Good, good, Jay. You've got a sweet day. Come on, Jay. You started early by the look of things. <laughs> oh, there's some women would drive any man to drink. Kirsty? No, no, no. Her mother. God, she gets worse with the years. Near Gern's her face off with the bairns as much as make a bit whole. It's plain unreasonable that bairns I fight like tanks. Happy oh, New Year to you. Good New Year to you, Jay. Ah, that's true, Jay. As it says in the hymn, it's a dog's delight to bark and fight. Uh, is it? Ah, uh, in faith, the average human can outdog any car that was ever put. <laughs> now, horses are different. Ah, oh, oh, wait to hell. No, I've got my Schulte and my Clydesdale, and we're fine friends, the three of us. Man, I've seen you leather the beast until folks spoke a sending for the cruelty. Ah, uh, a sound bit leathern and a pinch of kindness. That's the way to treat a horse. Damn time, maybe you're right. Oh, uh, it's a pity somebody wouldn't treat Kirsty's mother like that. <laughs> 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 she would leave a doornail with her fines and plaints. Throw an old Tory bitch. Ah, uh, no, no, there's worse folk in the Tories. Ah, well, must keep themselves damn well hidden. If I had my way, I would have all the Tories put into barrels of spikes and roll down the ground. Well, then there'd be a guy booming the barrel trade. The most the ready would be inside them. <laughs> and damn good riddance to rubbish. <laughs> the storm had cleared by the time they left, and I watched the two of them leave in the bright starlight. Not very steady, either of them, to go down into shrouded Kinradi, lying below. For a while, up into the new year, April and the turnip time, things at Blawiri went fair and smooth. One night, when Will had gone off to Drumlithy, and Father was up on the moor with his gun, I set myself a great baking. Warm work it was in that fine weather. So, alone in the house, I nearly stripped. Hello. Is Will about? No. He's gone to Drumlithy, I think. As we stood there blushing, I thought, such a look he's taking. It's a pity he can't study the blush to its end. Well, I was hoping I'd see him, in case he should leave suddenly. Leave? Who said Will was leaving? Oh, I heard he was trying for a job in Aberdeen. Maybe it's a lie. Tell him I called in. Aye. Ta-ta. Ta-ta, Ewan. Oh! But I guessed right well something new it was that kept Will so quiet, saying no more than his say at Plato Park. Yet if you looked at him, You'd more likely than not see him smiling to himself. <laughs> well, breakfast ready. All right, come in. I'm going to have the hay down with the scythe this year. Not spoil the stuff with them more. All right. All right. Is that all you have to say? 
Well, what did you expect me to say? Thank you, Chris. Ah, hold your damn weeper. Save your breath for a forking. No, well, not today. I'm off to Aberdeen. Fool thinks he can frighten me still. Well, you and Tavendale was down to see you last night. <laughs> he thought you'd be leaving Blue Weary. Did he? God, did we talk the bricks off a of healing when the gossipers are Kinradi? Ah, if I know Tavendale, he came down to take a bit kick at you, Chris Lass. Oh, Havers will. Now, well, he's Highland and course, so take care of yourself. Chris. Lord, I wish you were coming with me. What, to Aberdeen? I'd like to, fine, but I can't. Hurry up and dress or you'll miss your train. Oh. Aye. No, Chris, I'll, I'll be down in a minute. Well, well, I do. My, you look fair brave. Ach, oh, Evers. <laughs> well, to ta Chris. Well, what's the matter? What the hell? I watched him go down the Blue Weary Road, as fast as he could walk. But he hardly looked in father's direction, nor father at him. Sina heard him whistling, bonny and clear, as he did in the days when we went up the school road together. After a while, he looked round and stood still and waved his hand because he knew I was watching. Then a queer kind of pain came into my throat. My eyes smarted and I told myself I was daft. Mother was only off for the day. He'd be back at night. But Will didn't come back that night. He didn't come back next day. He came back never again to John Guthrie's Kinradi. Aye, he altered his death certificate and married her. Aye, I know. They say that Guthrie went up to Aberdeen and raged at the police. <laughs> Aye, the police just laughed at him and asked him if he'd lain with the Queen himself that he was so mad at his son. Oh, aye. It's fair to speak of the parish. It's all this education and dirt breeds nothing but a lot of damned impudence. Ah, it was fair shame for the will to go off and leave his father like that. He should think black burning shame. It just shows you what the world's coming to. You're here up bairns expecting to get a bit of comfort in your old age, and what did you get? Ah, I know. Still, it'll maybe bring John Guthrie's pride down a wee bit to have folk laughing at him. It's from Will. They've gone to the Argentine. Aye, the Argentine. You wrote to Chris from Southampton. Seems that Molly Douglas's mother has some kin out there, and they got him a job as a cattleman in some big bald Angus ranch. What's it like out there, Che? You're a well-travelled chill. 
to the fine place, would you think? It's fine, fine. Mind I've never actually been there, but it's a guy fine place, no doubt. You can depend on it. That coarse young Guthrie brute will never thrive. Dartman, young Guthrie's no fool to spread his but wings. Well, just to say myself. There'll be a judgment on him, you'll see. Him and his coarse tink quine. yourself. <laughs> be, may be. Get into the house, you white-faced bitch. <laughs> Mighty me, Mr. Guthrie. This is a sore, sore sight. Whatever will you do now? Well, whatever it is, I'll do it a damn sight better without you plucking about me like a doited hen. <laughs> It's a nice thing to say, me having left my own housework to come over here. It's the doctor's father. All right, and what's this? What's wrong with you now, Blue Eerie? Well, that's for you to find out. What the hell do you think you're paid for? There's nothing the matter with him except ill temper, and he's plenty of that. <laughs> Damned quine, you've got nothing to do but stand about like a lady. I'll get you some tea, doctor. Taking a guy long time his examination, the doctor. Now, I never expected to be away as long as this. Chael being from the field soon and wanting his meat. God knows what's happening at Peasy's Nap and me no there. I don't know either what's happening at Peasy's Nap. But if you're in such a tune about it, you'd better go home and find out. Well, that's no way for a quine to speak to a woman that's old enough to be her mother. I'm sorry. You I should didn't... think shame to cousin swear with your father lying up there at death's door. I didn't swear, Mr. Strachan. And I'm over weary to argue. It's bad, lass. Paralyzed. Aye, that's what the doctor said. John Guthrie will never get out of his bed again. What an awful thing to have happened. He was either that fleet and fast. I had a stroke, said the doctor. Kirsty was there for Christmas told. Aye, I heard about that. To see the coarse quine started to curse and swear at your wife while her father was lying near dead upstairs. Never say lies. I asked Chris if she'd given the wife a bit of a damning and she said she hadn't. It's a pity for it's high time somebody did. <laughs> my end no surprise, Blaweary had a stroke. No, after that tink well ran away. Aye, I mind you said there would be a judgment on him. It was his own rage that struck down John Guthrie. True. Poor Chris. What's the matter with you, Quine? Have you gone deaf? Why don't you come when I call? Five weeks he lay there with a whistle beside his bed when he wanted attention. And that was often enough. Five weeks of Chris do this and Chris do that. Half dead at night, I would find myself thinking a thing that wouldn't bear rethinking out in the sun. And Lord, if I could lie down for a day, how I'd sleep and sleep. Fold over my soul and my heart and put them away with their hours of vexing and caring. The ploughing was done and I was set to my drilling. And faith, it was weary work. But a worse thing came as that slow September dragged to its end. A thing I would never tell a soul. Festering away in the closet of my mind, 
the memory would lie until it died. The memory of John Guthrie lying there with the harvest in his blood. Chris. Come to me, Chris. Chris. Come to me, lass. Like they did in Old Testament times. I... You're my flesh and blood. I can do with you as I will. Chris. Come to me. Do you hear? Frightened and quivering, I slipped from his room and took to locking my door at night. It was a wild fear. Seeing father somehow struggling from his bed and coming down on me while I slept. That madness and tenderness in his eyes. Well so I slept you, but little at night. You then one morning, you well I heard Long Rob singing. And that singing was sweet to hear. To As though the world outside Blueiri was singing to me, telling me that this thing in the still dark house could never go on. No more than a chance and an accident it was. The wind-loved world of men. He was dead at last. Gone with his gloomings and glarings, his whistlings and whisperings. Sleep. I could sleep as I chose now. Often and long. It was raining early in the dawn, that day of the funeral. A fine drizzle that seeped and seeped from the sky. So soft and fine that you'd think it snow without whiteness. There was no sun at first, but it came up at last and hung there like a red ball. Just a little bit of drown it yourself. You know, Chris, I bet would hardly think to look at you that your father was new dead. Wouldn't you now, Mrs. Munro? It's near ten. The minister should be here soon. Yeah, I will. I've just been up and given your father's beard a bit comb. He looks fair decent lying there in his white shirt and tie. It was kind of you, Mr. Strachan, to see to the funeral arrangements. Aye, well, Chris is all young for this kind of thing. I must say she's taken it guy cool. I feel the speaker can rally her coolness. Aye, I thought the same myself. Aye, uh, you can, uh, 
it's not quite decent for the Queen to be going to the funeral at all. Well, it's different in this case, we are really having neither son nor brother to see him into the kirkyard. Aye, 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 I'm glad to see his prettiest and thought fit to put a white front over his working shirt. Oh, fish trap. There's nothing wrong with a man. He seems decent enough to me. At least you'll notice he's polished his boots. Aye, good morning, Mr. Gibbon. Aye, aye. You'll, uh, you'll take a... Uh... Uh, spirit, sir, yes, thank you. I'll take a drop. Aye, aye. Oh, you'll have a drama for all. Hmm? You and uh, your man, eh? I hardly think it shows respect. And you and T.T. as well. Aye. Oh, well, I'll just away and uh, tell Chris you're here, Minister. Aye. Aye. Tom, I was just saying to Chrissy that mm. when she sold her flowery, she can come up and bide with us in the north. Oh, aye, Chris. Some brave bit farmer would soon marry up there. We'll see. <laughs> I don't even know whether my father left a will yet. Ah, well, there's uh, no hurry to make up your mind, eh? <laughs> uh, I just uh, come to tell you the Minister's here. Oh, well, the undertaker will not be far behind. Chris, would you like to see your father before they screw him down? Well, goodbye, poor weary man. He was a good neighbor. Don't know. Kiss your father, Chris. Chris. Come to me, Chris. You're my flesh and blood. I can do with you what I will. Come to me, Chris. Goodbye, father. stepped easily and cannily. But I walked free and uncaring, lifting my face to the wet September air and the world that was free to me. Then I saw it was Ewan Tavendale that walked beside me. He glanced down just then, and I looked up into his eyes. I looked, and near stumbled in the slow walk because of that looking. still held off, and the wind soaking down the howl died away. The sun glinted through from high up in the hill peaks, from up in the lost coarse ground where never a soul lived or passed, but maybe some shepherds. You could see them far off, lone and lonesome on a still clear day. Maybe so the dead walked in the coarse deserted lands of death where only a chance wanderer showed his face, and the dead lapwings wheeled against another sun. I am the resurrection and the life, saith the Lord. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. And I listened to the words that promised resurrection and life through Jesus Christ our Lord, who had died long syne in Palestine, 
and had risen on the third day and would take from that thing that had been John Guthrie quick and was now John Guthrie dead, the quickness and give it habitation again. I minded then all the fine things of him that the years had hidden. The unwearying fight he'd fought with the land and its masters to have us all clad and fed. I minded how he'd smiled at me and called me his lass in the days before the world's fight and the fight of his own flesh grew over bitter and poisoned his love to hate. Earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. In sure and certain hope of the resurrection to eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ. father I'd never helped and forgot to love. I well, Mr. Simple. I, I hope you had a good trip down from Stonehaven. Oh, fair enough. I'm glad to see the weather's clearing, though. Yesterday was enough a day for a funeral. Aye, ah, it was that. There'll be a few bad calls in Kenradi the day. Did I? I met Chrissy Strip and go straight to bed as soon as she got back. Didn't want her to be the next in her no. grave. <laughs> and how's Christine taking it? Oh, she cried all night. The last must have been fair fond of her father. Ah, well, he was fond of her. Uh, you'll be referring to the... Uh, well, eh? I have it here, just as he made it. Aye, uh, that would be after the boy went off to the Argentine. Uh, just, yes, yes. I told your brother he was been fell sore in some of his family. Ah, well, John Guthrie was a man that would never listen to your advice. Aye, to hold me to mind my own business, and that was a clerk's. Oh, but he <laughs> trusted you, Mr. Sample. And the man had to be fell straight in his gate before my brother would yeah. do that. <laughs> well, oh, aye, here's a drum, Mr. Sample. Oh, that would be most acceptable. Aye, well. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Oh, well, here's... Uh, 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 uh. Well, now, Christine, I think we should get down to the business in hand. Yeah, well, I, I think, uh, Mr. Simple, if you could maybe just give us the gist here first. Oh, 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 that's easy enough. It's as sharp and plain as you please. Eh, uh, <clears throat> Your father wills that all his possessions in money and belongings go to you, Christy. Everything? Everything. The house without let nor condition. And the money amounts to over £300, which is in the bank. £300, eh? It's hard to believe that Father could have saved all that. Aye, but he had. Now you'll be able to do as you planned, Christine. Get back to the college, and when you've passed your exams, take your degrees in Aberdeen and become a teacher. What about Blawiri? Oh, the least died with your father. Oh, class, you'll be well finished with the filthy sauce of the farm. Sell your gear and be done with it. Ah, it's all very well, but if you ask me... John Guthrie's been gay, spiteful to his son. Oh, it is possible that, well, Guthrie might dispute the terms of the inheritance. Well, that uh, wasn't oh, just and what I meant. Another thing, Christine. Your father has appointed me to be your guardian in such law matters as may need one. As to the goods and the gear, they're yours to control as you please. Now, think well over it. I'll do that. Now I had all that I wanted. But I felt no longer that fine thrill that had been with me while I made my secret plans. It was as though I had lost it down in Kinradi Kirkyard. A knowledge came to me as I crossed Blueweary's parks. 
nothing endured. Nothing but the land I passed across. And I had thought to leave it all. My fine bit plannings. They'd been just the dreamings of a child over toys it lacked. Toys that would never content it when it heard the s'more of a storm, or the cry of sheep on the moors, or smelt the pringling smell of a new ploughed park under the drive of a coulter. Oh, I hated and loved that land in a breath. But my hate was no more than the fear of a child that cowered from the wind in the life of its mother's skirt. Sit you down, Christine. This is fine and comfortable. And what brings Miss Guthrie up to St. Haven? Or oh, you'll have been thinking about the well, no doubt. Just that, Mr. Semple. And what have you decided? I'm going to live at Blue Erie for a while. What's that? I don't want to sell the gear. Not just yet. Maybe you could get the factor to renew the lease. But you can't live there alone. No. I was wondering if you could find me some woman. Some old buddy in need of a home. <laughs> There's plenty of them, but even it so... It mightn't be for more than a month or so. Just till I've made up my mind. <laughs> Just. <laughs> a woman's mind. Just. <laughs> it's what I've decided, Mr. Semple. I must advise you against it. Running a farm's no life for a young lassie. No, 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 no. No life at all. Oh, this is the last thing I expected. My father's will said I could do what I liked. Aye. I did that. Well, I'll see what I can do with the factor. And there's an old weather buddy, Mr. Smell, and I'll send her down to Blau in the morning. Thank you, Mr. Semple. Ah. Well, you'll be going for the 11 o'clock train back to Gunradi? Haven't made up my mind yet. I thought I might take a look at the sea. Maybe have dinner in one of the hotels. Oh, there'll be guy busy at dinner time. Didn't forget it's market day. Mind the time, then. Hello, oh, Chris. Hello, Ewan. In for the day, then? Oh, aye. Just that. You'll be in for the mark. Aye. I was just going up to the inn for dinner. Maybe we, we can eat together. Oh, maybe. But what'll Mr Gordon do? Well, Gordon can dance a jig at the head of the mart for all I care. <laughs> He'll be in a fair rage. Well, I'll let him. I'm due a holiday today. I was working all last Sunday on a job living lambs. Where'll we go then? Well, I know a place. It's got a nice room. We can have uh, broth, oat cakes, boiled beef and turnips. So you're in no hurry back? Well, not unless you should be. What train are you taking back to Kinradi? No train in particular. Well, maybe we can have the day together. Aye. Maybe. Maybe it's too soon after your father's funeral. No. What shall we do? Well, we can have our dinner first, then, I know, we can walk out to the Nutter Castle. And that was how it came about. The Nutter was in front of us, and we were climbing down the path that led to the island. Above us, the rock rose sheer, crowned with the ruins of the castle walls. by the clamour of the brutes. But quiet enough in the castle it proved. Not a soul seemed visiting there but ourselves.
Down below in the dungeons, where the mouldering clefts where a prisoner's hands were nailed while they put him to the torment. There the covenanting folk had screamed and died while the gentry dined and danced in their lithe warm halls. I stared at the place, sick and angry and sad for those folk I could never help now. That hatred of rulers and gentry, a flame in my heart. John Guthrie's hate. My folk and his they had been, whose names stood graved in tragedy. In this place, died nine persons, prisoners in Dunutter Castle, anno 1685, for their adherence to the word of God and Scotland's covenanted work of reformation. Let's get out of this. Come down to the sea. I know a wee place. They say the rocks are hollow and the water runs far below the fields. The ploughmen swear they can see their furrows quiver sometimes from the storm raging under their feet. Do you like me a bit? Can't fool you at all. That's why we're out here lazing in this place together. Like him? It was as though my blood ran so clear and with such a fine, sweet song in my veins that I must hold my breath to hear it. So it was that I knew I liked him, loved him. Ewan? Hmm? Was it true? That story they told about you and old Sarah Sinclair? Does it matter? No. I'd just... You just want to know for all that? I don't want to know at all. You'll damn well listen now that you've asked. You're hurting my arm. Aye, the Kinradi Craigs will say you are lucky if that's all the hurt you suffer from that coarse tink food you and Tavendale. You might be thinking the same thing yourself. I didn't mean anything like that. I know fine what you meant. Aye, it's true about me and Sarah. It was the time of the year and we were both willing, especially her. I don't want to hear about it. Now you're frightened. Frightened that a woman should feel like that. Well, maybe one day you'll feel it yourself, Chris Guthrie. Maybe I will, you and Tavendale. But when I do, I'll get a better man than you to serve me. Chris! Come back! Chris! when they didn't have the men they wanted. I lay in bed that night and thought of Ewan, who was only a boy in spite of his Sarah Sinclair. I listened to the batter of the rain against my window and the swish of the great flowery trees.
I must see to the beasts. Oh, the kai will be all right unless the buyer struck. It's the horses I'm thinking of. Oh. Father put barbed wire around the field and it might draw the lightning. Oh. Uncle Tom! Uncle Tom, we must take in the horses! Yeah. Oh, no, no, it's not safe outside in a night like that. Oh, it's right, Kirsty. Uh, best go back to your bed and wait till the morning, lass. Storm seems to be moving to the south now, Chrissy. Aye, it'll be light soon. And my name's Chris. Damn it, Chris, is that all you are doing? You'll have caught your death, of course. Oh, no, I'm all right. Shh. Well, are your uncle and auntie still here? Aye, they're away back to Ochterles tomorrow. <sighs> Shut that window, you, and it's guy drafty. The rains brought out the smell of a honeysuckle. Fair drenches the air. Chris. Down and see me tomorrow evening. Chris, when will you marry me? Whenever you say you want me to. <gasps> oh, sorry, Ian, but I'm so tired. God damn it to hell, though, Chris. <gasps> oh, see, you can't help it yourself. <laughs> it was you that started me. <laughs> oh, we should waken them upstairs. Tomorrow night, then. Aye. I'll be waiting. Good night, Chris. 